six months, but I, uh, I feel adventuresome. I, uh, I don't think I'm just going to stop, sit down. I don't necessarily mean singing or... I'm not, uh, I'm not a lecturer, I'm not a writer, I'm not a... Uh, I'm just, uh, I guess I'm a performer, but I feel creative. Uh, I feel I need to be around people. I like it now. And I don't know what I'm going to do. But I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop.
six months, but I, uh, I feel adventuresome. I, uh, I don't think I'm just gonna stop, sit down. I don't necessarily mean singing or... I'm not, uh, I'm not a lecturer, I'm not a writer, I'm not a... Uh, I'm just, uh, I guess I'm a performer, but I feel creative. Uh, I feel I need to be around people. I like it now. And I don't know what I'm gonna do. But I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop.
dumb at the moment uh, from the past six months, but I, uh, I feel adventuresome. I, uh, I don't think I'm just gonna stop, sit down. I don't necessarily mean singing or... I'm not, uh, I'm not a lecturer, I'm not a writer, I'm not a... Uh, I'm just, uh, I guess I'm a performer, but I feel creative. Uh, I feel I need to be around people. I like it now. And I don't know what I'm gonna do. But I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. We can say it together. All that you, that you touch, touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. It's so convenient that you have that tattooed on your body. Yeah, I'm going to tattoo the next quote on before we meet again. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Welcome to the Ally Media Conference 2020. Welcome to the AMC 2020. We needed it that way. Sorry, my bad. Um, <laughs> we're way too excited and we're here. Um, who are you? Are. I'm Autumn Brown, Sagittarius Sun, Gemini Rising, and Libra mm -hmm. Moon. I'm also a queer science fiction writer based in Minneapolis, the epicenter of the uprising. And I'm also a mother of dragons. Very, very good. My name is Adria Marie Brown. I am a writer, period. Um, I'm based in Detroit. And I, um, although I'm not there right now because pandemic won't let me go anywhere. Um, and I am an auntie of dragons and a Virgo sun, um, Scorpio moon. And yeah, I'm gonna say it. I like long walks on the beach. And we are the hosts of How to Start the end of the world um a podcast <laughs> i'm learning about apocalypse and surviving it with grace rigor and curiosity i noticed that you avoided saying what your rising is is there a reason why you're doing that it just feels like so private like i still feel like i'm learning to work with my rising and i've had trouble with people of that sign and i'm just like i'm working on like embracing it fully still so okay. but just trust me it's good um the, <laughs> the themes of the Allied Media Conference this year are what is the frequency that heals and then what are we planting and what are we harvesting? And so we thought we would just share a little bit of that um, in terms of the show, in terms of each other. And then we're gonna dive into a very special guest who's going to make it all very clear. Mm -hmm. So, one thing I'll say about the frequency that heals is that you and I both actually took sabbaticals since the last time we were together for an allied media conference. Right. And I feel like we've both been moving towards healing by stepping away from patterns of martyrdom and moving towards lives that are centered in yes, centered in a frequency of yes, like what is the vibration of aliveness um, for both of us. And we were planning to all come back together in Detroit, but here we are on the internet in a masked world where everything is coming undone and every conversation is up for grabs. And I feel like we're doing our part of like the international group project of like, stay safe. Like AMC is doing that. We're adapting. So those are some frequency pieces. Yeah, we are certainly modeling that it's possible to be yes. safe and connected. Um, yeah, so much has happened, so much has changed in the last two years. And I think so many of us have also experienced that the pace of global crisis feels like it's speeding up. Um, and one of the things that's been beautiful about the last few months, especially, is to witness that our movements for racial justice are not just keeping up, but are also escalating mm -hmm. um, 
and advancing towards tangible victories, even as we are deep inside this process of grief and wonder. Um, and then inside of that incredible pace that we are all being forced to keep, the mm -hmm. pandemic also keeps requiring that we slow down and go inside and pay attention to the seeds that we're growing and to the stories that we're telling. Yeah, and I feel like as movement storytellers, as like movement justice keepers, we've been really learning like how do we be in all of this change while staying rooted in our integrity, while growing and actually having to scale up in a lot of ways. Like it's like suddenly I'm contained in my house, but I am connected to everything. And, um, and I have to kind of take responsibility for like what is unfolding, what is changing. And I want to say, I feel like we're not just spinning a tail. Like it doesn't feel like some PR campaign. It really is like we are making these visionary prophetic demands. We are making policy changes. And there's things I keep hearing this from elders. Like we didn't imagine that we could get that. Like, <laughs> this is different. Y'all doing it. And <laughs> I'm like, no, it's not like 68. But they're like, no, no, no. It, it is not it's really different than 68. <laughs> like, and it shouldn't be like 68, right? Like we didn't have the internet. We didn't have this way of connecting and spreading our tactics as quickly. Um, and there's also other differences. It's just as dangerous. Are we taking that seriously? So it's like, Things that we're moving, we're closing jails, we're defunding police, we're moving federal policy like the Breathe Act, like massive, tangible things are in motion. Statues are coming down, language is changing. Mm -hmm. Aunt Jemima, I mean, you know, it's like this, that is our time. This, is our, this is our time. Yeah, and and this is our time to heal. And I think one of the things that we're also witnessing is the way that uprising in as much as it is dangerous and terrifying and um, mm -hmm. risk-taking and breathtaking, exciting and isolating and all the things that uprising is, mm -hmm. it also can heal us. It breaks us open. It requires us to take responsibility for ourselves and responsibility for each other. So big shout out to Minneapolis, um, my new hometown. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're rising up here. We're tearing shit down. We're taking the risk of changing the compass that actually guides us. And, yes. and in addition to that, you know, we're, we are in the full court press, every part of the movement right now. Yeah. And I just want to shout it out because this does feel different from a couple of years ago is that we're all very, very actively queer now, at least on this <laughs> And I, I wanted to name that, like <laughs> everybody here, very gay, having gay things. Um, that includes <laughs> lovers tattoos. I, I feel like this is a unique thing that like not all sisters share is that within a month of each other, we both fell in love and got matching tattoos with people. And that just feels like important. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, never oh. in my life did I imagine I would get a matching tattoo with someone else. I actually, then it it. Like, except for Beyonce. I was like, Beyonce can do that. <laughs> right. But then now, right. you know, things Wait, change. You were going to get a matching tattoo with Beyonce? Or well, I, if she asked, I was like, if you want me to join you too with the four tattoo, I'm in. Um, but, you know, I just felt like that it was like, this is the kind of change that happens. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, five years ago, I would have been like, huh? so things change. We're changing. Another thing that's changed is yeah. that everyone finally respects astrology because Chetty Nicholas published a New York Times bestselling book about it. New York Times bestseller. Yeah. All right. So then what are we planting? What are we harvesting? Like, what are you planting, Autumn? What are you harvesting? Um... Well, I love this as a theme. I love that. I love this the, as a theme for the whole conference and as a theme Very particularly for um, the way that we're going to close this conference. Yeah. For me, um, what I'm planting and what I'm harvesting is really so deeply personal right now. You know, the last um, few years of my life really required me to go deeply internal um, and as I'm recovering from the last couple of years in particular, I'm, I'm working with rest as a practice, mm -hmm. gratitude as a practice, and love as a practice. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm planting the seeds of practice in my own life. Yeah. And 
Um, and then from a more expanded view, I feel like our movements are planting the seeds of practice, particularly related to justice and safety. You know, the pandemic has really required us to turn and face what it means, like what we lack in community when we don't orient to one another's lives is inherently valuable. Um, And then the movement to abolish the police, um, I feel like is requiring us to turn and face what we lack when we don't orient to one another as beloved. Um, Those, and so right now we're having to plant the seeds of new practices related to those really deep problems that are rooted in, in ancestral trauma, generational trauma. Some of those seeds are going to sprout more quickly than we can imagine because the soil is ready. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. And then some of those seeds are going to take longer to sprout because we're still remediating the soil that we're trying to grow those practices in. Um, in terms of what I'm harvesting, yeah. I think to be honest, what I'm harvesting is just the deep lesson of being a survivor of violence and abuse. And, um, the spiritual dignity that comes when you finally learn a really hard lesson. Um, And for me, that looks like having increasingly impeccable boundaries. My boundaries are so good right now. You should see, I wish, I wish wish there was like a, I wish there was something like material in the world that people could see so they could see what it's like. (laughs) They're really great. Um, I'm also harvesting the ability to trust myself as an empath and distinguish between myself and other and really like know where I end and where others begin. So, yeah. What are you planting? What are you harvesting my sisra? Um, you know, the first thing that comes at my heart is just so open. Uh, and I feel like harvesting being your sister, <laughs> you know, like I feel like you and I have planted so many seeds into our relationship. Mm-hmm. And um, and now I feel like I'm just harvesting like such deep respect for you and such deep respect for us as as Black girl survivors who have found love and found community and found safety and are creating those things for ourselves so deep bows of respect to you sister I love you um I also feel like I'm planting seeds of vision and like what does it mean to hold the territory of vision like to be like okay as everybody is moving like what does it mean to to take a step back and try to look and be like okay what's ahead Uh, and what can I be a a focus on aligning us with something longer um like to keep looking up from this moment and being like, okay, this pandemic is not going to last forever. This moment of movement is not going to last forever. What can we do to keep a futurist perspective? What can we do to keep thinking about what it means to win? And for me, where winning really means both a mass and an intimate healing, Mm -hmm. like ending these cycles of harm that right now feel totally permanent still like it's I you know it's like can I imagine beyond white supremacy can I imagine beyond capitalism beyond borders beyond toxic masculinity like not just can I imagine fighting them and being angry about them but can I imagine mm-hmm. way beyond and like my grandchildren grandbaby auntie babies not having that as their problem and what does it mean to look ahead and then try to be here now yeah. And so then the humility of like, well, I'm not out there. I'm right here right now. We're right here right now. And like most people, I'm sitting in my home with the whole world in my heart, crying every day about some grief and about these numbers and about this leadership and about how mental illness is dealt with in the world and like just all of that. Right. And I feel like I can contact the whole world and I'm limited. That is such a, it's like such a thing. It's like we have to be seeding into ourselves deeply now while also like harvesting all the connections we've built and made. I feel like I'm harvesting solidarity and rest and quiet and Mm -hmm. tenderness. I just went on a sabbatical and I was harvesting what it feels like to actually step outside of the urgency and the pace and then to come back in and like what looks different. Um, 
I'm harvesting all the wisdom of being a Black queer witch writer. I feel like I'm moving in harmony with the earth. A BQWW. BQWW, baby. <laughs> um, it's really special. Like, I feel like I've denied parts of it in various ways. And I never move alone now. I feel like one of my biggest harvests is mm-hmm. that there's no room for individual acts. Everything needs to be vetted and in community and held with and shared and decentralized and learning. And I feel that we in movement have spent the past while really investing time and learning to be emergent and adaptive and resilient and to center joy. And you know, Toshi Regan writes uh, for the parable of the Sower Opera, there's a new world coming. Everything going to be turning over. Where are you going to be standing when it comes? And I feel like we're ready for this. Like, we're like, I'm standing right here. I'm standing right here with my people. Like, it's just, Everything it's. Everything's going to be turning over. Everything's going to be turning over. Mm. Mm. Toshi is church. Mount Kia Cyril is church. Alexis Pauline Gums is church. Like, we literally have all of our friends holding church. Everything is good right now. Yeah. And yeah. then there's this whole incredible queer astrological technology that can also be helping us ground and adapt and be emergent and resilient and prepare for the future. We need queer astrological technology. We need Chani. Need. We need Chani. You're so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm like so moved at your sister talk. We're very in love with was, each other. Oh my God. It's we're very so in love with you. We talk about it. really in love with you. <laughs> and we call it mutual each other. love. And he said, <laughs> Can he be knowing about my life? Like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know why he said that. And she read me and then I cried. But really, Chani, um, just before we even dive into all the things we want to ask you, Thank you so much for how you have aligned yourself with movement and particularly made yourself a channel between the stars and the people. It is like such a gift that you have and you can have gone a million different directions with your calling and you just keep giving us more and more. Congratulations on your book. Congratulations on all your success. And like everything you're doing right now is just chef's kiss. There's a reason Oprah's like, yeah, that's my astrologist. Like, (laughs) Um, like, you know, they got me in a lawsuit. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I won't tell if she doesn't tell me. And Oprah, we're almost. You gonna get matching tattoos? <laughs> we're gonna get matching tattoos with, a big o, um, with an A in it. Oh, hey. All right, some people will get that. Okay. So, um, Danny, thank question. you so much for including oh. me in this love fest. And also congratulations to both of you for all of your accomplishments and best-selling books and sabbaticals and all of the things that you put out. Like, I'm just, uh, I'm always in awe of everything that you both are involved in and, and gifting us with. And I get so much um, strength and wisdom and uh, so many blessings from everything that you both are doing. So thank you. Mm, I'm so ready for this. I'm gonna process in bed and like just lay there and cry. Shani knows who I am. So, <laughs> me, um, question for you. Because you are looking at the stars and you have like we know we've listened to you, we've talked to you, and you've seen a lot of this coming. And I wonder now, midway through. 2020 dumpster fire magic year how does it feel to be in this moment having seen what was coming in the stars Mm. um strange honestly (laughs) I think I think all astrologers would kind of answer in that vein um it's it's a lot to see a year like this astrologically mapped out and to and to have to think of how to break the news to everyone and while keeping spirits void and also our selves steered towards uh 
future that we all want to live in. Mm, yeah. And so how do you unpack something that looks like you can kind of see the outline of it? Like that's <laughs> ominous. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> fun is not the word I would use um and so and then to live through it and be like like I didn't even think this yeah and but then to see it in its context is also in a way and I know you both will understand this but it's so poetic and exact when you have 2020 as your hindsight so one of the main signatures of the year that started at the beginning of the year, like right at the top of the first week of January was the Pluto Saturn Pluto conjunction, which a lot of people are talking about now, but it wasn't just Saturn, which is structure and bones and Pluto, which is the underworld and exposing all of the things that fester because they've not yet been exposed. And so it's like all of the um, underbelly and, and the workings of it. So when the two come together every like 30 years or so, we have these huge kind of changes in culture and a lot of times, um, you know, health crises are linked to that and, and the fallout of them and what that means. But not only did those two come together, but the sun, the Mercury, the sun, Mercury, Saturn and Pluto all came together in, in a conjunction, in a collision, we could say at the top of the year. And so it was like a seeding of something that was going to mark us for a very long time. It's a severe mark. And it's something that exposes the bones and the framework of how we've, how we've come to be where we are. And I think the pandemic was like a first layer that helped then the movement expose all these other deeper layers. And so the way they worked in tandem was wild. I mean, it just like, in one way, it's like, that's, it's, there's so much tragedy and difficulty surrounding it. And the human experience is so hard, but the larger framework of what this year will eventually help us to reframe and restructure, I think will be felt for a really long time, or we'll look back on it and be like, <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to think about you, just what you were naming about that Saturn-Pluto conjunction as something that happens roughly every 30 years to then think back to late 80s, 80s. 90s and like... The early 80s. Early 80s. As like a, early mid 80s when the AIDS epidemic was really... Uh, uh, right, exactly. Okay. So, just, and all of that unearthed and exposed and... Right. Mm -hmm. Well, so speaking of um, unearthing, exposing, and dumpster fire, tech, um, potentially dumpster fire astrology. Magic. <laughs> I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about what the astrology is for the coming months, particularly, say, around the first week of November. Tell us what's going to happen, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the most important sit down, everybody at home, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so the framework for what's going to be the most challenging astrological setup is already in play. Um, Saturn left Capricorn for a little bit, then retrograded back into Capricorn as of July 1st. Oy. Mars is in Aries and will be in Aries for a very, very long time this That's year basically yeah yeah it's like six months of mars and aries why because mars is going to station retrograde in september so mars is the planet of aggression anger war courage vitality energy drive it's our way of inserting ourselves into the world got it we need it it's an sword it's got two edges you know, we can cut a lot of different ways. You can do harm and you can also open up a whole path. Right. It is stationing retrograde. When it stations retrograde, it pulls focus on its attributes. So personally mm -hmm. and collectively, and again, it's happening now, but it won't really get kind of going until end of August. But personally and 
collectively, we're being asked to understand what we do and how we work with anger, rage, um, bitterness, hostility, our own hatred, or how that, you know, all those things that we don't like to consider that we might be embodying or carrying around with us. And then collectively, it's how we deal with things that are with that kind of fire. What do we do with that fire? Mm. And as it stations retrograde, it's doing so in an exact square, which is an uh, aspect that causes friction with Saturn. And Saturn is the structures, the overlap. <laughs> yes, <My Saturn>. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of the hardest things that can happen in astrology is a square or a conjunction or an opposition between Saturn and Mars. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're happening, they're happening for so long because Mars is stationing retrograde and, and Saturn moves slowly. So the tent, the friction that starts in August lasts all of September and into October and Mars is retrograde through to the mid of November. In the midst of that, Mercury stations retrograde not to station direct until November 3rd. She was, okay. So we've got communication issues. We've got issues with mail and delivery services and all of those things, voting ballots, da da da. Mm -hmm. And we've got this hostility and aggravation and the stirring of that to also contend with. And the feeling of Saturn being in a square with Mars feels like trying to put a lid on a pressure cooker. So, yeah. Yeah. The, it's a really tough corner of the year. It's where I think a lot of us, Astrologers originally had our, you know, our eye on on this piece of the year, not necessarily in the beginning. Although the beginning, Saturn and Mars traveled together for February and March and April, and so we were in lockdown. Like we wanted to go, but we were stopped. Interesting. That's and then exactly. when they separated, the the uprising started to happen. Yeah. So there was all of a sudden it was movement, and like everyone was on the streets, and it was like. Yeah. It had been so much inward that it just, you know, poured outward. And now we're back to this really, really important mm -hmm. and defining friction. Okay. So I think how we, and, and Adrian, you addressed this in a post recently. And I was like, this is it. That how we deal with disagreements with each other yeah. and how we deal okay. with, with each other how we respect each other through conflict. How do we deal with conflict mm -hmm. with each other? Yeah. Let alone the larger kind of thing is I think is so vital. And I think we have so few examples of how to do that respectfully. Yeah. It's hard. And I, I do wish often that like every conflict, every anything that happened, we would sit down first and like do a whole chart <laughs> situation. Like, I wish every organization was like, here's the chart, every relationship, yeah. you know, um, yeah. and I didn't used to feel that way. Like, I feel like I was so skeptical in a way for, you know, yeah. I was like, Virgo is true, but I don't know about the rest of this. And, yeah. you know, but I do feel like, you know, even that, that piece actually, it's like, I put it out, but even in some ways fumbled parts of the delivery and, I'm still trying to understand like, yeah, but I want to know how we be in conflict since conflict is our lives for the next period of time. And I want to be humble to like not adding to conflict while untangling. And, but it is that thing of like, and there's a pressure cooker. So like every, yeah. there is some explosion that's just like, this is the right time for it. And yeah. so when we have this kind of hard astrology, right, which is basically what you're giving us is the hard, um, the diagnosis that this is coming and it's not easy. And so it's not like the astrology that's like, eat your greens, like do your workouts. And like, it's going to be like, you're about to win girl. You know, this is like the, you could easily be debilitated by fear here. Or you could easily be just locked in a cycle of um, the kind of rage that doesn't move things, the kind of rage that doesn't change, the kind of rage that doesn't liberate, you know, and, or, what, like, how do we actually take this astrology and work with it in a way that allows us to be closer 
deeper with each other and, and actually moving forward? Such a good question. And I think it's so individual yeah. in terms of how we, where we are with everything and what, what we need to feel like we're valued uh -huh. and we're important and we're cared for. When the two of you were talking and there was just talking about how much you love each other and how much you've worked on your relationship, all the things I was like, it just, it was so moving. Cause I thought if we felt like this, if we really felt that cared for, yeah. I think so much would kind of naturally work itself out. I think, and, and again, this is, you can't apply what I'm about to say to everything, but I think a lot of the rage comes from not feeling valued yeah. and not feeling loved. Yeah. So how do we do I'm that for ourselves? Attack. You know, yeah. it's like yeah. under attack. Like it's like, oh, black women were under attack. Trans women are under attack. It's like not just valued, but like violently dis, dis undervalued, violently. Yeah. The opposite of that, yeah. Right, yeah. right. So how do we, from whatever position we're standing, we're in, we're located in, how do we make sure that as much as possible, we're, we're demonstrating acts of care mm -hmm. and, and extending out compassion, love, however you want to say it. But I think care is such a great verb. It's like, how do we care in in all these different ways while maintaining our boundaries, which I think is essential to care yeah. and not getting burnt out, which I think is essential to sustainable care. Yeah. But how do we use every, every tool available to us to try to interrupt all of that harm and all of that violence and recreate the world that we want to live in? But mm. But, and also it requires us to do some really uh, big work in our own selves. I think, I think understanding where you get bitter and what that bitter taste feels like in, you know, in this, in the system is really important. Mm -hmm. I think that, and then of course, because Saturn's so involved, there's like this massive piece of structure. So it feels like the Mars is trying to, you know, say, this structure cannot, and the Saturn is like really putting a heavy hand on. So things like we see in, in Portland and what's happening with that kind of authoritarian, yes. disciplinarian yeah. system of harm is, is really important to pay attention to because it feels like, again, since this is the beginning of that mark, that that alarm bell is going for a very important reason. Yeah. And a, a lot of people have said, you know, like this is a prototype. So how do we then also think about those dismant yeah, all the all the work of dismantling all that. We can't we you know like if you're someone who's still surprised about it, <laughs> maybe that's not it's not going to get us anywhere like we can't, no one can be surprised about how these systems work anymore. It's all been exposed. The information is there. So then how do we apply our personal energy towards this kind of larger systemic change that has to happen for a very, 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 very long time? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I hear and first, Well, can I say one thing, Autumn, which is, I really want to uplift and I want to say thank you for naming that care piece as the, as the response to um, terror, like is like, oh, deepening how we're holding each other, deepening how we're holding each other. And I keep it, especially like, I just got a video the other day that the they're showing up in Detroit and starting to snatch people off the streets. And like this strategy that's been deployed in the Northwest is spreading. And I was just thinking of like, what what would it look like if, they couldn't take any of us, right? That they couldn't take any of us. Like that, that somehow we 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 grew our mycelium networks. We oak tree together. We did our thing, such that we couldn't be taken from each other. And like, just what if we spent the next six months in that focus? It's like, who am I? 
I don't have to hold on to everybody, but who are the two to four people or whatever that I'm going to hold and not let go. And I'm going to know where they are and they're not, we're not going to go alone. And it just makes me think strategically, like how do we, how do we systematize care? And there's some great resources from our AMC community about this uh, systematizing care. So I'm really grateful. Like we're in a, in a good moment where the resources are also meeting that need. Sorry, Autumn. Yeah. I'm, I mean, it's interesting in, in what you're saying, Chani, what I'm hearing is that we have to be in this dance with the practice of care and then also getting in right relationship with our own like anger and aggression. Mm-hmm. And um, and part of that meaning like being really comfortable like getting to a place where we can experience our rage yes. and feel the righteousness of it and feel the righteousness of channeling it also. Yeah. And that, that, you know, I know for myself and like my own healing work that it's been a critical part of my healing journey to figure out how I appropriately righteously and healthily channel my rage and aggression. Mm-hmm. And that is what enables me to, care for myself, to care for my children, to care for my loved ones in ways that, that feel sustainable. And right. so I'm, I'm thinking about that related to the astrology coming in yeah. October, November, that, that as we're figuring out how we extend and build these networks of care, that we understand that like, that our rage is a resource and, and a, a tool for us to like hone how we actually use it so that it's not only something that's being used against us. Mm -hmm. Um, And on that tip about care and care as a resource (laughs) that's been, you know, centered often inside the AMC and that's been work, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we can, because we're here, because we're here inside the Allied Media Conference, opening the Allied Media Conference, if we can talk about the Allied Media Conference as a collective body, Mm -hmm. um, like what's our chart all about? How do we make meaning of this particular moment, this like virtual conference moment in the life of the Allied Media Conference and its role inside of broader movements? particularly wondering if there's any like asteroid level (laughs) wisdom about how we move towards healing during this time. We use the space of the AMC to move. Like how do we use the space as a part of how we're moving right now, especially given the heart astrology that's ahead. Can you talk about us? (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about me though. (laughs) So I pulled up the chart that we have for the opening of AMC. And we put it at 9 9 a.m. on June 11th, 1999. Prince was there. Um, And so... (laughs) So cute. Okay, so the chart that I have now it's the it's the end of Cancer Rising, so we're we're just assuming that the conference started at nine. But the rising for the chart is Cancer, and as we know, the rising sign is the most personal point of a chart because it's the one that moves quickest. And so, Cancer, of course, is all about care. It's about creating emotional connections. It's about creating family. It's about bonding and being emotionally sensitive, emotionally attuned, uh, working towards some kind of emotional intelligence, if you will. Mm -hmm. We do have the asteroid Astrea, the goddess of justice, (gasps) next to the AMC's Ascendant. What? Justice. <laughs> yeah. So that's really sweet. But the the main theme, the main like the first impression of the chart is connection and and building uh, some kind of family unit and wanting to create security through 
um, the emotional bonds. And then the, the most, sorry, what? Oh, no, I'm just moaning. Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and then the planet that rules that ascendant is the planet that is the, the planet that steers the direction of the chart. So where does this moment when we're picking a moment to begin something we want to make sure that the moon is in a good situation and we also want to make sure that the ruler of the ascendant is in a place where we want um is in a house a place that we want the event that want that we want the to resonate with the event that we're doing so the moon the ruler of the ascendant is in the 11th house of groups and associations <gasps> And networks and conferences and good fortune <laughs> through the people that we know. Oh my God, I love this. <laughs> We're like living our purpose and our best lives. I love it. And not only that, but the moon is in one of the strongest signs it can be in. It's in Taurus, so it's exalted. So there's a kind of level of fame that the moon can receive from being really good at its job. And what's the moon good at? The moon is good at nurturing and nourishing and replenishing and caring for. And where does that happen? In terms of groups of people and gatherings and networks and building community. And so also because it's in Taurus, of course, there might be a lot of talk about generativity and growing and, um, you know, plant metaphors and all of the things because that's Taurus's deal. Taurus is all about, you know, our relationship to, we could say agriculture, that's our relationship to the cow and the bull, um, yeah. but fertility and resourcefulness and productivity and also just incredibly stable. So it feels like this chart is like AMC is like, I will be here for the group year mm. after year, hard times and good. We will just keep showing up. We're building something. Taurus, little by little, it's just like here, here, here's a snack, here's a nap, here's a, a farming technique. Hi. So, love yeah. Yeah. That's that. really sweet. I love it also just makes me think of like, oh, we're like the little blanket soft it's like yeah. gathering of humans, the little cuddle pile that's consent balancing. Yeah, I mean. yeah, definitely cuddles, massages, naps, <laughs> consensual, but still. Um, the so the the moon's in the place of network community. It is a planet of care and connection. It's sitting with Saturn which is, as we know, a planet of structure. It's a structure queen. Um, but it's also a planet of holding space for the collective when it's in the 11th house. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's like what, and because it's with the moon and because this is a day chart, Saturn's actually in pretty good shape here. And so moon Saturn can sometimes be challenging, but the moon is past the conjunction with Saturn. And because the moon is exalted, it actually helps Saturn. And so Saturn's like, okay, what? how can I help you hold space for care? And like, what are the ways in which we build structures and build uh, boundaries and have like a compartment for us to gather within so that the moon can do its job and give, give forth of what it's got. And so that whole thing about how do we demonstrate and build care into our connections and into our practices and into our institutions and into our, like, all of those things or laws or however we want to think about that. This feels like a space to do that. And then the moon is also sitting with <laughs> Pallas <laughs> Athena. Mm. So Pallas Athena is the wisdom goddess. Hell yeah. She, you know, she, she springs forth in, in the Greco-Roman myth. She springs forth from the, the head of Zeus. But that's the whole patriarchal kind of bullshit thing of the fact that the patriarchy swallowed the matriarchy and then Pallas Athena jumped out. But it's good she's the, the heads though. Like we're like, fuck that. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. 
And then uh, staying inside the head of a man. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Judgment. No offense. (laughs) Um, Pallas Athena is the warrior goddess. She's the protectress of the city. She's she's also um, the weaver. She's the goddess of arts and culture. And she's all about the intelligence. She's about using our uh, creative life force for mental progeny, for our ideas. Mm. So would you say that AMC, life purpose, or its purpose is at least in part to create community, nourish community, build space, hold boundaries, hold the structure for community so that community can come to its collective wisdom. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. There's a reason why I love being here. (laughs) (laughs) Designed by the stars. Um, (laughs) Thank you for that. That does feel, it's a really beautiful way to also understand a little bit of like what the work, you know, one of the things I always get moved by with the AMC is that, there's what happens when we all come together. And then the AMC is like a way of being out in the world. You know, it's like, oh, we begin by listening. Like we're thinking about boundaries. We're thinking about how we grow. And it just feels lovely to have that affirmation of the stars, of the picture of the sky at our birth. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what was destined. And we're living into our destiny when we do set good boundaries or do figure out the good structures that can help us feel home with each other. So Thank you. Mm. Um, I want to ask a question now that's a little bit more just about you, Chani. You know, one of the things that you do well in the AMC is think about playing our positions, right? Like, what are you great at? What is the unique thing that you can bring to the world? And then how do you shape that into what movement needs? So it's never just like me shining, being great, but like, how do I, and I just, I'm sitting over here with my little tarot deck and like pulling cards every so often. And I was like, Chani, who's Chani? And I was like, the star, of course. Oh, <laughs> the star. The star. I was like, of course, that's Chani. So I don't know if you can see, but like, you know, Aww. just, I hope you have that's some sweet. water somewhere. But basically it's just the idea of like, how do you, in the star card, you know, my art is tarot. It's like, it's all about how do I really let shine from me what is only mine to shine? And so mm-hmm. I'm curious. I feel like I've watched you move more and more into position of like, here's how I'm going to shine um, and really align myself with movement in the way that I shine. So I'd love to know, like, do you feel yourself shifting? Uh, is that like my perception or is that actually intentional and strategic or, you know, is that part of your process? And how do you feel yourself moving in relationship to all the changes of the world in terms of bringing your, your particular gifts? Yeah. Um, I mean, I always feel that the work changes me mm-hmm. and that I'm trying to be adapt. That I'm trying to listen mm-hmm. to what is happening. And I feel like, you know, before the uprising, before the pandemic, like last year, there were times where I was like, where is it? Like we were kind of decentralized and that's fine that's part of the whole thing and I kind of I I remember having those moments like how do I keep speaking to you know liberation and liberation practices if but without being disingenuous to the like without trying to like insert my you know but by holding it respectfully and Mm. also there's a timing to things obviously I'm in astrology but (laughs) there's this this way that it's like When's, when are people the most open to right. possibly like feeding a little bit of extra vitamins? And so, you know, when something like the pandemic happens <laughs> and then, yeah, and then the uprising is I'm, I'm in that place of like complete, uh, Uh, I'm trying to listen to say, to think of and and be aware of how I can utilize what I've got in the best way. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, 
it's a it's its own pressure cooker. I don't want to do it wrong, but I'm going to do things wrong. And I don't want to, I want to serve the moment as best I can. And I'm always thinking about like, who am I speaking to? How can I speak to as many people? How, how can I, how can we collectively, how do other people do it? Like create a place where people want to be in the conversation. Yeah. And I, you know, I went to, uh, a, a Black Lives Matter rally here in Los Angeles. And I just was, you know, one of them that I went to was so particularly moved by, and it oh, happens always, but so particularly moved by the way the space was structured in such a way that I was like, anybody here would want to come back. Like, this is so inviting. There's so much love here. Yeah. So there was so much intentional care put into the space. It was just, yeah. And so I'm always thinking like, how do we, how do we do that? I have so much anger and I have so much rage and I have so much hostility and it has done so much damage in my own life. And I'm trying to always hold that and, and also create more space where more people might want to join. And Patrice often says, like, we need you at the we end of you. her. We need you. And I, people need to know that they're needed yes, also. Exactly. So I'm holding all those things and also trying to pay homage to everyone that's part of this work now and that has been before. Uh, because I think that, you know, at this moment, like, Angela Davis's work is so like it's so like oh my this you know like everyone's been saying this for so long and practicing this for so long and it has to be a collective effort and it's always been a collective effort and it's always been groups of people so I guess that's just been where really I've been meditating on a lot and listening and learning and um, wanting to deconstruct that in myself that white supremacist you know patriarchal belief that it's an individual thing yeah and I think when people feel lonely yeah. and isolated, yeah. that gets exacerbated. Mm. Yeah, that's the most dangerous time. I think that's, I think so much of what we're in right now is the unhealed vibrational technologies of loneliness, isolation, being unseen, um, thinking that you were supposed to have some power that you don't have, like that we're, you know, I think that breeds for toxic imagination. And I think right now we're in like toxic imaginal space of white men mostly, but like, right. And I am like, oh, like the reason none of this makes sense is because it truly doesn't make sense. It's rooted in um, that isolation, which is not our nature. You know, I just finished reading Braiding Sweetgrass and mm. like so much of that book is like, we are meant, we are organized, we are processed we are programmed to belong to the earth like to have a deep belonging to the planet to to land and all the different ways that we have been displaced from that has resulted in we really cannot a lot of us really cannot feel our belonging and we can't even feel how important it is to listen to those who still have that connection to land right like oh, there's a reason we're meant to orient towards indigenous leadership because there's an original instruction that many of us have been so displaced we can't even hear it. And so that lack of belonging processes into a lot of different things. But I think I think in, yeah, in the country right now, that's what I feel. I'm like, oh, like you're so far from belonging to earth that you act against the earth. You're so far from belonging to humans that you act against other humans. And and yeah, thank you for that. And the fragmentation, just the yeah. splintering off. You can't follow it. It doesn't make sense because it's not, it's no longer exactly. woven in. Yeah. yeah. I have a follow-up question to what you were sharing, Chani, about just about, you know, I hear you like um, interrogating in yourself any sort of, um wherever the instinct comes towards individualism, you know, interrogating that and figuring out how to push the energy back towards the collective. 
Um, and I wonder how you hold how you hold that in your practice as an astrologer, given that astrology is so deeply personal and individual. Um, and because I, I know, I know for any one of us who's like working with our chart, um, there can be a, <laughs> there can yeah. be a little bit of a, like, no, I'm just, you know, it's sort of <laughs> amazing, like my future, my past. And, <laughs> and so, you know, and, and increasingly I'm having more and more, you know, friends and folks in my life who, who we're sort of turning to each other and being like, really get our charts read together, shouldn't we? Like, you know, uh, um, and yeah. yes, I'm just, I'm wondering how in your practice you balance, especially because I know like having taken your courses that you often orient to, you know, the charts of individuals. Like we understand the charts of individuals who have made impact in the world as a way to help us understand our own charts. Mm -hmm. Um I'm wondering how you balance that in your process as an astrologer, working with individuals, working with individual charts, helping people still hold that orientation to the collective yeah, and not getting trapped in their own history or, or future. Virgo nature. Yeah. <laughs> how do you help them not get trapped in their Virgo nature? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that the technology of astrology yeah. is works in it. I, I trust it. So I've learned how to trust it and it's actually helped to heal my relationship to distrust, like my, the things that I've distrusted. Hmm. And so the work that like the ways in which I've experienced betrayal or what have you and then it like setting me up for like not trusting and feeling like I need to control everything learning how to trust the technology of a reading and the structure of a chart has allowed me to relax into knowing that I, that when I think when people get a reading that feels like they've been seen and witnessed it is a, it is a profound act of care not from me, but from the thing that contains us all. Mm. Uh, and I think that when we feel like I'm made on purpose and these things that I'm good at are good for the world, mm. we can more easily kind of relax into the ways in which we are built to serve. Because I think we're built to serve all in really unique and very specific ways. And I think that I hope my hope is that when we accept that, when we can radically accept that about ourselves, then we can just kind of like get to the thing. Mm. Get to the joy, get to the good work, get to the, as John Lewis would say, good trouble. Like how what what part of trouble am I supposed to be, you know, like how do I, how can I you know, be part of an uprising? What's, how does it actually, how is it actually best suited for me? Um, we can be part of a revolution from our bed and we can be, and I think all of that shows up in our chart or at least invitations to it does. And so if we can see that we're made on purpose and perfectly, yeah. I think we can better accept our, our work our calling <laughs> and our work <laughs> and, <laughs> no. like there's yeah. work and then there's my work <laughs> our email yeah I have a question in there actually following up on that follow-up right because that follow piece around like I don't want to follow on your follow-up you can follow on my follow-up all right so the also the, the whole pandemic is a musical in my house, I don't know what's happening for others, but um, there's songs. Um, but I noticed that you do, at least the new moon horoscopes always come in the form of affirmations. And I feel like a lot of your astrology is in the, the mode of affirmation or in the style of affirmation. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, like, how did you come to that being like the way, right? Because I think that, you know, 
when it comes to the hard astrology or whatever, like I don't feel a sense like this is going to be hard or this is going to be this. I just feel like here's the affirmation I need to move through this next period. But like, how did you figure out that that technology and is there something in it that we should be using, you know, like, should we bring that style into everything we do? (laughs) (laughs) I think it comes from being like an eighties baby where, you know, like all of the like power, like capitalist ladies were like in their big shoulder pads and they were like, I am going to be successful. (laughs) And, you know, there was like all this like affirmation technology linked to like wild success and Lamborghinis. And like, I really kind of grew up in a lot of that. And then there was like all of the like spiritual ladies and all of the like, you know, wooey, um, feel anyway. goody, self carry, yeah, things that were also like, you know, the affirmation of the, and then all the meditation stuff. And like, I was just swimming in all of that. And I also had a really grounded teacher uh, as a grandparent uh, kind of person who was a Reiki master and was very, very uh, not into spiritual bypassing. And so I had this kind of confluence of um, like, do not, <laughs> do, do not think that this is like just a joy ride. You can't just think your way out of pain and suffering right. and the stuff you have to heal. Right. And also being so inundated with, you know, all of the Oprah-ness of the 80s and 90s. Yes. Um, <laughs> that I think it was just like I had had so much of it. And then I one day I was like, I, I don't know, I was probably listening to a lot of it or something. I was just like, I'm just going to write the horoscopes like this. And yeah. I loved it. And I was like, weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so I kept doing it. Um, And I try to, it's always that fine line of like, how do we stay open to thinking outside of the paradigms that cause harm and only want to control us without being, uh, you know, disconnected from the very real challenges we face and, and yeah all of the things that are really that we need to hold with a lot of care and a lot of thorough thoughtful mindfulness I love it because we always think in terms of Octavia Butler who on one hand was like not into tarot like manifesty woo but on the other hand in her journal wrote her affirmations and manifested her life Mm-hmm. And I feel that every time you read get, by millions of people. He's like, you know how many people are gonna read me? Or but that's how it was gonna happen. And also I'm gonna fund like scholarships at Clarion. Like she was very precise. And every time I get my new moon horoscope, I'm like, okay, I need to actually write it down. I need to say it out loud. And sometimes I fake it till I make it. Like I'll just keep I'll do it and then I'll just be like, oh. That seems to be working with this. I'm like, this really works. Like if I affirm the things and I check back mm. in the next month, I'm like, that changed, that worked. So anyway, just good on you. Yeah, we're very <laughs> suggestible, I think. Thank you. And uh, I do it too. It's, it's actually like the reason why I started doing it is because I so desperately needed it. Yeah. And it really helped to dig me out of a lot of self-pity and despair. Yep. Or it helped to keep at least like pull my mind out for long enough for something else to open up. So I'm always, I don't know about you all, but I'm always only writing to myself. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I'm writing for everybody, but I'm really like, you know, right. It comes from that. Yeah. I think most writers are like, uh, even if you're not writing your own story, so much of it is like, I'm writing what can only come through me. Like I'm the channel yeah. for it. And so it needs yeah. to make sense to me. Right. I'm right. Yeah. Your, wig, you, your hair looks incredible right now, by the way. I just needed to. My wig. Incredible. Thanks. I'm a divorcee. It's an identity. <laughs> um, so on this. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> technologies um and because what when i'm i'm hearing in in what you're describing chani is this 
is like, you know, thinking, and you know, the whole frame of this plenary, right, is like astrology as a technology. Yes. Um, and that, you know, affirmations are a technology, the charts are a technology, you know, all these, all these different component pieces are parts of how we use the technology. And so there's this question that we were curious to ask you about, like, healthy and unhealthy uses of our technology. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Yeah. Similar to like, yeah, you like over pull a tarot deck. There's a question to think about, about, you know, reading the charts of others and mm -hmm. um, particularly, you know, yeah, how, how healthy is it to read the charts of potential political leaders? How healthy is it to read the charts of major political moments current or coming? You know, I mean, we just spent time looking at the astrology of, of the election yeah. coming and, um, so maybe the question, maybe the right question is not how healthy or unhealthy is it? That's not a good binary. Um, no binary is a good one. Um, but it's maybe not helpful. Maybe the better framing would be what, what are the risks and benefits of engaging with the technology in this way, you yeah. know? Well, I think it's really If you want to know the answer, if you're prepared to accept the information <laughs> that is given, if you're prepared to actually ask the question, um, then it can be it can be really helpful. Yeah. I, you know, like astrologers have, have looked at the charts of president presidential candidates um, and predicted who is going to win for a long time. I know some colleagues that did it and got so much, you know, negative feedback back that they were like, I'm not going to do that anymore. Cause it's just too charged. Um, but there is, you like can look at it you know, accurately and then people were mad at them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Like, I don't think anybody, you know, touched. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and there's ways that you can look at people's peak periods. Like people will have these periods where they will come to prominence. And so that's a pretty good indication that if they're also running for something like the presidency, that they might be more successful than somebody that isn't moving into a peak period-ish. Mm -hmm. um, so there's things that you can look at like that to see like who's coming up, who's not. I haven't spent a lot of time on it uh, with, yeah. with, with these two who, <laughs> these two characters. Um, I mean, I know, I know Biden's chart a little, a lot of Scorpio. Um, yeah. And I certainly know the other one's chart. Um, and yeah, it's a whole thing. I mean, I think that knowing 45's chart definitely helps to put a lot into context. Mm -hmm. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the election. So, but <laughs> Yeah. It's, you know, electing somebody with that kind of a chart is like you're in for a lot of change and a lot of destabilizing and a lot of chaos, which can be good if you use it in a certain way or it could be disastrous if you use it in other ways. So there's yeah, definitely I a theme. Like I think about that, like understanding charts. I think of like looking at charts and understanding listening, you know, like I'm like, is this person more open to listening? Because that's all I really care about in the president <laughs> is I'm like, yeah. you are hired by these people. Can you listen to them? And yeah. how widely can you listen? You know, like, can yeah. you actually hear ideas that are not your own and help move them and that, that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question, which has been kind of... Um, I've been trying to sit with, I'm like, is this a connection or am I just trying to make it a connection? So, you know, my whole thing is emergence strategy, emergence, like I looking at it. and looking at like, what is our relationship to change? And I'm a mutable sign, right? And so I've been having this aha, like, is it important that I'm a mutable sign this moment? And is it important that like, what matters about the mut mut mutable cardinal fixed 
component of astrology mm-hmm. in moments like this. Like, mm-hmm. do we have roles, you know, roles to play? Mm-hmm. You'd be like, oh, the mutable signs all need to be doing this and the cardinal mm-hmm. signs need to be that or something like that. So I just mm-hmm. wanted to hear like, as much as you're willing to teach, I almost want like a whole yeah. Lecture. Okay, um, cool. But just like <laughs> break, down, break down what those are, maybe for folks who are not at that level in their astrological journey yet, and yeah. then yeah, what does it mean for how we how we organize ourselves and play our positions? Yeah. So, so, so there's the sun, and then there's of course the ascendant and the moon, and then you've got all the other planets, and so some charts will be heavily one modality we call it and it really is a mode of being the cardinal are initiators Great. fixed are stabilizers and mutable are the ones that are in the process of change from yes. one season to another they know that one thing is closing and another thing is emerging but it's not quite here yet. And their role is to be in that in-between space. So flexibility, versatility, adaptability are the main themes of mutable signs, which are Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius, and Pisces. (laughs) Okay, well, I guess I got the right sign for my lifestyle then. We have the mutable system. But our, our tale is because our podcast then also started in the right season. So that's great. Yeah. And so the car, the folks with a lot of cards. There's a Pisces. So all three of us are mutables. Wow. So you're like hurting, hurting kittens. I love <laughs> kittens. <laughs> and so, so the people with a lot of cardinal are really good at initiating the thing beginning the thing they're like you know they're good at like going and off in different directions not necessarily for the long term but really good at that starter energy it's the beginning of a new season so aries cancer libra and capricorn great and then the fixed signs the fixed part of your chart is really good for fixing something it's like stabilizing it Mm-hmm. It's the part that's like, I am here and it come, it leads with confidence because it's coming from the central place. Like everything else moves and changes and stirs and starts and stops and does all the stuff, but I'll be here. And Great. so that's the fixed part of us are good for the like, Hey, movements happen over centuries. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going anywhere that like we're like things can happen quickly but we have to always come back to the thing so um someone with a lot of Aquarius like a Toni Morrison or an Angela Davis is like they're like fixed in terms of their ability to problem solve and think strategically and be able to use their intelligence and their mind to envision something and have it be like very thoroughly thought out fixed signs are also leo so it's like i'm gonna shine consistently leo season yeah and then scorpio yeah is that fixed emotional hub so it's like these deep reservoir autumn's laughing <laughs> very deep we're deep very autumn deep. i don't know why you're laughing at the depth because <laughs> We're going to talk about that. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> you don't have to say something if you're laughing. <laughs> this is what I'm always trying to tell you. And I have you, lots I'm, of friends who are Scorpios. Yeah. Me, we all, my best friends are Scorpios. <laughs> <laughs> Moon. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and just, then... Uh, also Taurus, Taurus is fixed earth. So the, the moon of the AMC chart is like that. I am the rock, I'm the mountain, the, the enduring force of sustenance. And so fixed, yeah, fixed signs, we can keep coming back and unpacking what they teach and keep coming back to the place that they hold and keep coming back when we get tired of being flexible and starting a million things and like you know rest somewhere because it's there so people do get tired of change (laughs) (laughs) 
Actually, wait, I mean, actually, they do get tired, Adrian. <laughs> I, know. I mean, seriously, I'm just like, really, I could take a break. We could all take a break from change for about 50, 11 years. But yeah, thank mm-hmm. you for that. That really helps me. Yeah, because the mutable signs are able to blend uh-huh. and merge and allow, also allow things to move. They're yeah. okay with the in-between. And so we yeah. need that to help us bridge the moments of uncertainty from one change to the next, because there's always going to be change. And so the mutable signs are like, Oh, you know what? We can use this from that and that from there and over here. And Mm -hmm. of course, Virgo is always synthesizing and, and digesting and chewing on like, Oh, okay. That goes really well there. And that goes there. There's a stitch from that. And it's uh, doing all of that cleansing uh, kind of witchcraft and Gemini is always like you know in the breeze of information and gathering the ideas and being able to articulate them and disperse you know knowledge and build community and friendships and Sag is just flying through space on the quest <laughs> yes out Everything there <laughs> <has changed. laughs> that's right I love that. the journey <laughs> Sag is the journey Sag is um. <laughs> pop on the back of a Sag and your life will be interesting so one follow-up I have on the mutable cardinal fixed one more piece mm. is and this is kind of a sharp pivot maybe but Sag is in the house so um but me. one of the things I keep thinking about <laughs> is in this moment we're being asked to hold For most of us, it feels like a much wider range of actual emotions at the same time Mm -hmm. and in a given day um, and be able to pivot inside of that. And what what I've been saying with is like, how do I actually hold the the range from the grief that I feel? So it's like I feel rage and grief on one hand, and then I feel like massive love, massive opening, massive celebration, massive leaping forward. I look at my comrades in the movement for black lives. I look at my comrades that are um, uplifting Breonna Taylor's life. I look at my comrades, I'm like, we are grieving so hard and I am so moved by us. And every day it feels like that I'm, I'm supposed to hold that whole spectrum like in any given moment. And, um, and it's exhausting. And I've spent like years learning how to feel as much as I can. And I'm like tapped out. So I'm like, I think there's a lot of people who are like, was tapped out, you know, earlier, Mm -hmm. but I'm like, how can, is there, are there aspects of this technology Mm -hmm. that can help with holding that full range and attending to, because I think we need to not back down, but you know, it's like, we need Mm -hmm. to not back away. From being yeah. with what is and what is is very wide emotionally right now. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I, maybe it'll come to me astrologically, but, but for me, like, I know I need nature uh-huh. to help bring me back to and restore this something that shows me about a balance or a way of being it's like nature is that place I think that it's like it can also help tune out the stuff and just reorganize me yeah um but I think we just I mean we have to stay so human we're not machines that are able to metabolize grief and then you know create a a itinerary of what to do with it (laughs) and <laughs> so I literally have tried to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, you know, we're living in a moment that is uh, the amount of information that we digest all the time is just literally unheard of for our systems to be able to organize. And where there's just, there's like emergencies all the time. It's like, I get, you know, I used to go on my phone because I was kind of like, you know, always in it. And now it's like, oh my God, okay, I'm going to go in. Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to find and I don't know what I'm, what I need to extend myself to and also be part of, you know, 
ushering in or communicating about, and I've got to research on everything I, you know, talk about. So I know like the origins and it's like, it's just this whole other deal. So I think that if it takes us away from being able to care for our life in the ways that are also local, then I think we always have to just be in that balance. Like, am I so far out that the things around me are, are not getting there are the plants dying and the cats not fed and the, I don't know, the partners not tended to, and like, have I been missing, you know, lost in all this for too long, but what do you do? How do you handle that? Nature is also my, my thing. And, uh, I, been working with a new therapist and a healer and she's been like cedar is actually the medicine for you so like literally when I'm in moments where I'm like ah I'm out of my league here I'll just burn some cedar or ah I need a little bit more protection like I'll burn some cedar and there's a tree nearby that I've just basically made friends with and been asking Mm -hmm. like can I make an offer to you and then can I have some of your medicine and it's a very positive energy but I literally I keep laughing at myself because I'm like I'm literally out here hugging this tree in the suburbs of my parents house just like okay you know <laughs> this is where I landed and Octavia would say you don't know where you're going to land you don't know who you're going to be with but now the apocalypse is happening and now I have to find it what about for you Autumn what do you do mm-hmm. for me the the medicine is expression of love Mm. you know I think the medicine for for like if what we're talking about is like the overwhelm of the the enormous range of emotions that we have to move through on a daily basis then Mm -hmm. I've I have found you know tying back to what I was saying at the top about love as a practice that I have found for me, the medicine for that overwhelm is to engage in like discrete expressions of love. Like nothing settles me more quickly than brushing my children's hair, which is a discrete uh, expression of love. That's just like, you know, and sometimes it's chaotic to get there. It's like, yeah, you have to get in the shower. You have to get in the shower. You have to get in the shower because I have your hair. And then the shower is happening. The conditioner is happening. And everything's happening. And then they're sitting in my lap and they're just relaxing while I'm like working, working it through, working it through. And then there's the moment where they're like, are you done? And I'm like, yep, I'm almost done. And they're like, can you keep going a little bit longer? You know, and that for me, that settles me and it settles them, you know, it's like, and it, and it also requires me to just like not be up here, you know, it's like, like any activity. Um, So for me, it's, yeah, it's those kinds of, of really clear, discrete expressions of love and care. Um, Okay. I think we have time for one last question. If we can. If you yeah. can pull it off. Um, it. <laughs> so, okay. So astrology itself is a queer feminist liberatory practice. We do know and believe this. Yes. Um, and that makes us think of witches and witchcraft, uh-huh. which is mm-hmm. another queer feminist liberatory practice. <laughs> So we're wondering what is the, like, how do we magic astrologically or astrologically magic? Like, what is the, (laughs) what is the place that those things, you know, collide? Um, I'm asking for a friend because personally, like, I'm not a witch and I don't cast spells. It's like a whole thing. I'm not allowed to do it. Um, It's just a different magic. I'm an empath. It's a different type of power. And I I know that now. Um, But... (laughs) On behalf of all of my witch friends, I'm also curious to know, like, is it okay to cast mean spells? <laughs> if you want the, if you're prepared for the reverb. Oof. Yeah. The equal and opposite reaction. Got it. If you want to metabolize and hold that. Yeah. Okay. But that's your, yeah, that's a responsible witch 101. 
<laughs> I'm like, where's my wand? Okay. <laughs> but yeah, how to astro magic? Do you have? Oh, I actually have a wand like back scratcher. Back scratcher. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is never far so that is magic <laughs> this got me through the pandemic you just can't reach all the parts with your hands so um but yeah how to astro magic yeah so there's there's times that are imbued with properties that we want to work with and again depending on what it is we're wanting to do we pick a chart that has a good sign for that. So again, it's like phenomenal that AMC's chart has the ruler in the best sign it can be in, in like one of the best houses it can be in. And yeah. it's literally a sign for building community and all of that. And so just like that, yeah. Like if I was helping them build, a, uh, pick a chart for that day, I would have been like, oh, this is gorgeous, perfect, beautiful. Don't even worry about it. Just go. <laughs> so the yeah so then you can like if you want to do something for self-promotion or for partying or for you know creating more connection in your life and you pick a chart with a planet that is aligned with that intention <laughs> and you you make sure it's in a good position and that's your kind of moment that you can capture Mm. and make a kind of astrological amulet out of it and you're like this is the this is the energy that I want to align my action with and then it's imbued with that energy so it's maybe less spell casting and more just like aligning right. yeah which is magic, so helpful. could you give us maybe a star infused alignment blessing for this let's, allied media conference like let's do it you know Mm -hmm. The the thing that is really beautiful about this moment, um, because of what we were just talking about, I'm just pulling up the chart for the moment, is that the moon right now is in Virgo. How cute. <laughs> 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 and it is a baby moon. So it's just emerging. It's just getting going. It's like just gathering its light and it's finding out what it wants to be. And so all of our intentions and actions that we want to align with this moment um, have the uh, capacity to keep growing with us as the moon grows. So if you want, you can uh, kind of join us um, for a little closing intention setting, if you will. And think of it as that we're aligning our energy and our um, intentions with the way this moon grows so that when it becomes full in a couple of weeks, you can look up at the sky and be like, I remember when I was at AMC thinking about what I wanted to mm -hmm. grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's in the 10th house right now of the public. And so... Oh. It's a really nice moment for us. Okay. So if you want to like feel your body, if you want to close your eyes, if you want to take a deep breath, please do so. And we align ourselves with the magic of this moment, remembering that there is a divine order to all things. And the more that we trust the system and intelligence of nature to organize itself around us and to also show us how to keep showing up, the more we'll inevitably trust that connection and follow it. And so we ask that the any and all obstacles to our courage, any and all obstacles to our own connection with self and that bigger organizing intelligence be removed with as little effort as possible. We ask that we be 
aligned with the ways in which change needs to happen through us, through our lives, through our work, through our relationships, and that we remember to center care and generativity in all that we do. May we remember that we are cared for by the energy that brought us here. We are sacred to the energy that brought us here. And we deeply, deeply need each other. Mm. Yes, we do. Thank so you. That was beautiful. Annie, you're such a gift. I was sitting oh here God. the whole time holding my giant amethyst that I was also with me during the 2017 eclipse. Oh. <laughs> I'm feeling here and feeling full and blessed. Um, so incredible to be with you both. So be it, see to it. Um, as Octavia taught us, thank you. And just for folks, you know, whether this is your first Allied Media Conference or your 25th, whatever it is, um, really lean into this experiment of doing it virtually, showing up virtually, extending your energy virtually. The next uh, thing that's going to be happening, there's an opening ceremony tonight. It's going to be lit. We have Mama Monica Lewis Patrick from Detroit, um, incredible warrior. Little Now's Esperanza Spalding, who's on everyone's love playlist and is like a magic bomb of light. Bev Incredible, who's like a sexy mama powerhouse. Um, Aya Simone, who's like a gorgeous harpist, beautiful star. Kaswa, who I was just learning about today, is super skilled. And Tunde Alanaran like pulled it all together. Uh, there may be more people and like pulling all these things off the internet, but it's going to be incredible, worth your time. And the rest of the conference, every plenary is available. Every ceremony is available. Tons of stuff is available. So Go for it. We go everywhere. Candy, thank you. Thank Love you so you. much. Love thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.
moment uh, from the past six months, but I, uh, I feel adventuresome. I, uh, I don't think I'm just gonna stop, sit down. I don't necessarily mean singing or... I'm not, uh, I'm not a lecturer, I'm not a writer, I'm not a... Uh, I'm just, uh, I guess I'm a performer, but I feel creative. Uh, I feel I need to be around people, I like it now. And I don't know what I'm gonna do. But I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop.